Good, so you've maybe noticed that I put into the chat um, the refuges and precepts, and we'll begin our time uh, doing this chant together as we've done in the past. And besides just being a nice thing for a group of folks to do, it's also just uh, a way of recalling what it is we're up to in our Buddhist awareness practice. So Buddha is the word for being awake, wakefulness, awakenedness, And that person who lived and taught 2,500 years ago, of course, is just a reminder about what we can call on or what we can attune to hear this capacity that we all have to be awake, right? As opposed to this capacity we all have to be distracted or superficial or disconnected or wound up in some vortex of anxiety or fear or reactivity. But we have this other capacity to be awake and what do we want to be awake to? Well, the truth of the way it is. And some of the truth of the way that it is is quite beautiful. And some of it is qu quite horrific. And, uh, you know, just the <clears throat> amazing complexity and really unbearable, yeah, just unbearable layers that is being exposed here in Minneapolis and probably around the world with the trial of the officers responsible for the killing of George Floyd and so many other things that are just more apparent about the world we live in and what we're part of. Our beastly nature, our fear, as well as our kindness and capacity to connect. It's all here. So when we say Buddha knows Dhamma, you know, we're taking refuge in Buddha, being intimate, being open with Dhamma. It can sound, you know, we can interpret it idealistically, but it's, there's something that has to happen for Buddha to be present, to be intimate with Dhamma. So we, we want to shake in our boots a little when we take refuge in Buddha being intimate with Dhamma. It really means growing up in the deepest sense and um, growing roots into our world and its beauty and its horror and injustice and yeah, just all the ways that our work, you know, as people who care about taking care of each other, our work is clearly not done. And Sangha, the third refuge, is just this growing capacity to respond creatively, not from a fixed idea, but from a more nimble, creative, alive place of Buddha being intimate with Dhamma, being awake to the way that it is in all of its breadth and depth allows us to be Sangha when we're interacting with one of our kids or interacting with our partner or interacting with the wider community, trying to make our home a, a more just or a more safe place for everyone to live. Because <clears throat> I'm sure you've noticed whether you're a parent or us thinking about this as a citizen or whatever, we can't figure out like how to be a good human being, like write it down so we have a plan that works. The only way to really live our life as a partner, as a parent, as a citizen that cares about justice or cares about the health of our world is to really invest in this Buddha knowing Dhamma to the real nth degree, the radical nth degree, which means this full exposure. In a way, the one way I like to think about these refuges of Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha that we chant is this uh, <clears throat> just appreciating, and it just makes so much sense, you know, as an engine of awakening 
that what releases wisdom, what releases true love. And it just seems so right that what releases wisdom and love is total and complete exposure to the way that it is. It's like we don't get awakening, we don't get the wisdom and love without the exposure. And, you know, the way the Buddha came to understand our predicament, his predicament, our predicament as a human being, is that we're natural processes. And so awakening then also has to be a natural and impersonal process. And that natural and impersonal process happens when Buddha is intimate with Dhamma. So it's just a little background why we chant. We've been chanting this slowly at the beginning of our Buddhist studies classes since the, the late 90s when we began. So let's do that now. And uh, it's in the chat. Chat if, uh, and if you just came on, let me just paste it again in case you didn't see it the first time. Settle in to relatively still and comfortable sitting posture. There's an interesting story from the suttas where the Buddha was explaining to some of his students about his years of doing ascetic practices, fasting and doing some seemingly extreme breathing practices. And in all that fasting and those other ascetic practices, he 
describe the kind of pain, painful sensations he had to deal with. And this is a, an age old tendency in human culture, spiritual culture that when we get how unreliable the pursuit of pleasantness is, you know, having a nice shelter, having nice friends, having some wealth, etc. Then the thought can arise, oh, I'm turning away from sensuality. I'm giving up on wealth and shelter and safety, food, etc. So you find that tend tendency towards asceticism and a lot of spiritual culture. And the Buddha explained that as much pain as anybody's ever gone through, I've gone through. People might have experienced as much pain, but nobody's experienced more pain than me. <laughs> and he talked about how, you know, how hard it was on his body, kind of kept the body unhealthy, all of those ascetic practices. And his mind really learned a lot about tolerating pain, but no awakening. So eventually he came to understand asceticism as a dead end. So that should, you know, we should be happy that he figured that out for us. So we don't have to go down that road. And there's a very poignant place in his practice that he shared later, you know, after his awakening with his students about when he had sort of gotten to the end of the road of asceticism and really got clear that it doesn't lead to awakening, doesn't lead to a wisdom and a release that his heart intuited was possible. Because he, you know, had a lot of wisdom, he had this intuition arise, his, this memory of a time when he was a little boy and his father was sort of the chief of the area. And it was a festival day, like in the spring, the first day of plowing the field, something like that, evidently. And because he was a, you know, part of the head family in the area, they made a really nice place under a beautiful tree for the little kid to hang out while the father and other leaders did the ceremony of the sort of first plowing of the field or whatever it was. And so just because he was alone in that nice little place, his mind settled into a really peaceful, quiet place. In early Buddhism, we call it the first jhana. And it just means that there wasn't any greed, wasn't any aversion or fear, wasn't any distractedness. And this is a memory now he's having, remember, after many years of ascetic practice, and he remembers how pleasant that time under the rose apple tree was when his heart, mind settled into that very beautiful, refined, peaceful, expansive state. And the question arose in his mind, that was really pleasant. Do I need to be afraid of that inner pleasantness, that inner good feeling that arises when the heart is settled, when the mind, the heart and body have settled? And his intuition responded to that question. No, I don't need to be afraid of that. Maybe this is the way. Maybe this is the missing medicine, missing ingredient for this path of awakening that I'm on. So tonight in our sitting time, let's explore that same path, that thread of inner pleasure, we could call it. Not the pleasure of having sense treats, delicious foods, 
pleasant smells, nice touches on our body, pleasant sounds or sights, as nice as those things can be. Often they just lead us, leave us wanting more, wanting them to last. But let's explore this other category of pleasure. Maybe in some of the reading you've done, you've come across what's called the unworldly pleasures. These are pleasures that don't lead to greed. Like the pleasure of a calm, settled heart. When we're tuned in to the quality of calm and subtleness, perhaps even now, feeling the body, the heart and mind content with the way that it is, not needing the conditions of the moment to be different than they are, and notice the pleasure, the pleasantness in this ease, in this calm. And the more we attune, not with greed, but with interest, the more the heart lets go, the more the heart settles. And perhaps the more pleasure there is, this is the pleasure of seclusion, the mind choosing to seclude itself from sense experience that might be agitating or disturbing, not forever, but for the time being. For the time being, we turn inward to the experience here and now. Whole body awareness, breath coming in and out. And in particular, interested in this thread of pleasantness, the pleasure of seclusion, the pleasure of simplicity, the pleasure of contentedness. And no matter whatever other experiences might be there in the periphery, perhaps it's wholesome, it's appropriate for a period of time to be interested, to be paying attention to the pleasure that's available, even if it's subtle. Why not keep it in mind? Breathing in, aware of joy and ease. Breathing out, aware of the possibility of calm, joy and ease. And we're not trying to suppress anything. We're just interested in the wholesome pleasure that the Buddhist teachings point to. The pleasure that's available here and now, whenever the mind secludes itself from what is agitating as best it can.
And this pathway or this thread of inner pleasure that has this sort of natural and recognizable pathway from the relatively gross inner pleasure of simplicity. So like when we're just with the breath as we're breathing in, just with the sensations of the breath breathing out or with the experience of embodiment, Just the simplicity of this being intimate with this anchor, this object of meditation. There's some pleasure in the simplicity. And then the more resonant pleasure of calm, the body settling. And the even more beautiful pleasure of joy, that lightness and buoyancy. And an even more resonant inner happiness of ease and contentment. And eventually maturing into the most refined happiness, which is a peace and inner quiet that is so trustworthy and healing. So we just start where we can. If you're doing the mindfulness of breathing, you're just aware of the breath in and out and notice that it feels good that one's experience is simple. Feeling the body, feeling the breath in the body And just follow, keep in mind that thread of pleasure wherever it leads in a more refined, in a more healing direction. And then of course, when you do get distracted, because it's likely to happen in moments, notice how that feels. You can even ask, what's the feeling here? Make peace with whatever it feels like. So if there's tightness and that's unpleasant, oh, this is unpleasant. Can that be okay to feel the unpleasantness? And then begin again. So we'll continue in silence now for a while.
keep it really simple. We're choosing to be interested in the pleasure of being present. And you can use a meditation object like the breath or the whole body, or just being aware of whatever's predominant moment by moment. But the real object of meditation for this set is to be curious, not to force things, but to be actually curious about the wholesome pleasure of being present. We follow that thread as it deepens and becomes more refined, more beautiful as everything settles. And be willing to begin again and again. So we're being asked to access our faith, our confidence, that there is a relatively subtle but deeply meaningful pleasure that arises whenever the heart is present. And the more stability of present moment awareness the more clear and the more healing this pleasure is. And so if we don't have some confidence, we're not going to look, we're not going to be curious. And we're just going to believe the idea that I'm stressed out or my mind's a mess or my body hurts. And the attention is going to keep paying attention to what's unpleasant. And then we'll feel like we have good evidence that it isn't pleasant and on and on. 
becomes a self-fulfilling story. So for just a few more minutes, maybe three more minutes or so, see if you can keep in mind this interest, a sincere interest in noticing the pleasure that's here and now. Pleasure of simplicity, being present, and the calm and the ease and the peacefulness that naturally comes out of this continuity of present moment awareness. And whenever you feel ready, allow the eyes to open. And we'll continue sitting still for a few more moments. But with the eyes open, just sensing the community and notice the pleasantness that arises when there's some warmth and friendliness sensing that we're here together in this weird Zoom space. We kind of know we're here and yet distant too. Just let the heart break a little in kindness and friendliness. You might have four-legged friends in the room with you or a dear one in the other space in your house or home and neighbors that you care about. This is another way to access the wholesome inner pleasure that doesn't lead to attachment, just the pleasure of kindness and compassion. It feels good to have a loving heart. But just see if you can sense that in a very ordinary, uncontrived way even as simple as caring about the body. And then when you're ready, stretching the body out however you need to, as we finish our sitting time. Nice to be with everybody this evening. And uh, we'll have small groups, real strong encouragement to be brave and stay for the small groups. I know some of you are on East Coast time and maybe even a few of you from Europe, so it may not make sense. And I think Gabe, you might have noticed, sent an email to the Buddhist Studies group uh, today or recent, recently and just seeing if people who are on the earlier in the earlier time zones, if you want to have help creating small groups so you can discuss 
what you're learning, then respond to that email from Gabe. And so we'll end for the small groups about uh, 8.35 Central Time. And you probably guessed if you weren't here last week, uh, this week for the small groups, and then just in terms of my reflections that I'm going to offer now, is what we can learn, what we have learned, what we can learn about being aware of pleasantness. And this is a nice place for us to um, deconstruct and get clear about what the Buddha means by worldly pleasantness versus unworldly pleasantness. And this is true for all the feelings, you know, whether it's unpleasant or neutral or pleasant. And it's, it's actually not as, uh, it's not as complicated as you might think. And it's really this ethical dimension. So whenever we're meeting, knowing a pleasant experience, and the tendency of that pleasantness is to trigger greed, then we call that a worldly pleasant experience. But not all pleasant experience experiences trigger greed. Right? Like I was trying to point to in the guided meditation tonight, some pleasantness, um, some pleasant experience really lead to um, letting go. And this is one of the great things about um, concentration practice is just to see how it's we're accessing, like to really drop for the mind to drop into a quieter space. We're just accessing a natural process meaning there's a feedback mechanism there. And it really, uh, it really revolves around connecting with that inner pleasure. And the thing is, if you grasp, like if you're starting to feel, you're meditating, let's say, and you're starting to feel calm and it triggers greed. Oh, I really like this calm feeling. I want more of it. Are you gonna get calmer? No, because Wanting to get calm is an agitating thought. And if we're identified with the thought, I really want a good sit, I really want to get calm, I want to sit better than anybody else in the room, well, that's a disturbing thought to have. And things will get tight in the body and in the mind. And then that unpleasantness of the tightness is very likely to trigger more reactivity. Oh, I lost that good feeling can't believe it. And then on and on. So when we notice that the body, the mind, the heart is settling and it feels good, then the instruction is to notice that good feeling. You don't need to grasp it. So there's, this is the alternative. Like whenever there's a pleasant feeling, and this is hopefully what you've been learning at home this last week when the homework was really to get interested in any pleasantness through any of the six gates, sense gates, you know, pleasant sight, pleasant sounds, pleasant smells, pleasant tastes, pleasant touches, pleasant thoughts and memories, just like resolve. And if you didn't do it this last week, do it this next week. It's better to, to kind of, begin by taking pleasantness as a teacher than unpleasantness. Because one of, this is a real shadow in Buddhist practice, is like we're all intensely interested in unpleasantness. And, you know, it makes sense because life is hard for human beings a lot of the time, not always, of course, but a lot of the time. And so we tend to get skewed towards dukkha, 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 right? The, the sort of ordinary unpleasantness of what arises in the mind sense gate, the thinking mind, and what arises in the five, through the five physical senses, right? The unpleasantness of all that. So for, if you didn't, didn't feel like you bow down to the teacher of pleasantness this last week, then do it this next week, okay? You're my teacher. And I, I resolve 
to be a sincere student. And, and really you have to, I mean, I know it sounds a little contrived, but when you wake up in the morning, leave a note next to your nightstand. So you remember to repeat, oh yeah, today I want to notice pleasant sights, pleasant sounds, pleasant touches, pleasant smells, pleasant tastes, pleasant thoughts and memories. I want to notice, I want, I, it's like a mindfulness bell will go off whenever something is even close, you know, relatively pleasant, you want a little mindfulness bell to go off. Oh, this is a chance for me to notice, right? Through my mistakes and through my successes, how I might relate to this pleasant sight as I'm walking and seeing the crocuses coming, pushing their way through the dead leaves or whatever it might be for you. A cute puppy or a, you know, a bird you haven't seen recently. And you know, oh, seeing, pleasant, right? There's contact through this eye, the eye sense gate. Seeing is being known and it's pleasant, okay. And you'll see that, that fork in the road where the mind through this avenue of greed wants to own that pleasantness, wants to have more of it. And so then it's not so much the pleasantness that's being known once the mind goes down that road, it's the reactivity, which of course will be greed with pleasantness, some version of greed. But there's something else we can do. Instead of going that pathway, we can do the pathway of being mindful of the pleasantness itself the push, the delight, but not the wanting to own, wanting to have, wanting to keep. And that's a skill we have to learn how to be aware, intimate with pleasantness without going into attachment. And one of the the reason that I, I bring up, like in the guided sit, the whole pathway of settling, you know, where we had the initial pleasantness is like, I had a busy day and now I'm sitting relatively still in a quiet room with my eyes shut and my body, you know, relatively still. And compared to the rest of the day, my experience is really simple. And you know what? That feels good from the relative chaos of everything that happened before to the relative simplicity of just sitting here, feeling my breath, feeling the body sitting, hearing the ambient sounds in the room. You know what? The mind finds the simplicity pleasant. And see that begins this whole thread that I was talking about, the thread of seclusion. And the nice thing about that thread of seclusion, the mind getting quieter and quieter, is it's self-reinforcing and it, and any kind of greed that gets triggered will be immediately seen as going in the other direction towards constriction and things getting tight, right? And so we can learn, like people who are really good at deeper states of meditation, meditative absorption, they re they get really good by teasing out effort that's counterproductive, like trying too hard. Because it's a natural dropping in. And trying to drop in doesn't work. <laughs> but dropping in will happen when the mind is interested without greed but just appropriately interested in how good it feels. Oh, this is pleasant. And you, may, you might have noticed in the guided sit tonight, um, it's not easy to keep in mind the pleasure because, you know, probably through evolution, our mind is much more interested in threats, i.e., unpleasantness, than it is in pleasure. It's sort of funny. Even if I have a lot of nice stuff, 
you know, we tend to be, is someone going to take it away from me? <laughs> it's hard for us just to abide in pleasure. So please continue your exploration. And I strongly encourage, you know, if, to stay for the group, the small group tonight, and to really unpack that in your group of three or four people, you know, each person shares for a couple minutes and then whatever time left, there should be five to 10 minutes after everyone gets a chance to share, just to share and ask questions about experiences of pleasure. And there's a real art to talking to each other in these little Buddhist circles that we have, because we're really talking about experience directly. You know, oh yeah, I was home. I went to the fridge. I took out my favorite chocolate pudding or, you know, whatever it is. And uh, I noticed that just thinking about it, there was some pleasure there. Or, you know, I had this sit in the morning. There was this nice feeling of calm. I noticed that it was pleasant. When I noticed it was pleasant, it got more pleasant. So it's like the way, as Buddhist practitioners, the way we talk to each other when we're having a Dharma conversation is in that blow by blow by blow manner. Because the basic premise that the Buddha taught from is that we're living in a lawful space, a lawful universe, a conditional universe. So when I share to you about my own experience, <clears throat> I say, this arose, the mind knew it, you know, noticed it, and maybe it noticed it with greed or it noticed it with some wisdom, and then this happened, and the mind either noticed it or didn't notice it initially. So we're sort of trying, it's, it's a technique or it's a skill we have to develop. You know, it's a way of being really honest with each other. Instead of telling somebody my, the interpretation of what happened to me, we try to paint a picture that sort of is in line with this lawful conditional nature of our experience. That's how things unfold. And each moment of my experience conditions the next moment. And that's really what we're trying to kind of um, deepen that insight. Because that's exactly why we study feeling tone. Because this moment of mine and this moment of yours you're having right now, the feeling tone is conditioning how we're experiencing this moment. Just like how we're experiencing this moment is going to condition the next moment. So the whole reason the Buddha tells us, hey, <laughs> you want to be free? You got to stabilize your present moment awareness and use it to get interested in the feeling tone. It's the not seeing feeling tone that is the cause for so much suffering. I'll just share a short uh, discourse uh, from the Buddha before going to some of the questions that people sent in. This is the Vedana Sutta. You know, sutta is an interesting word. It's just similar to when you when you get uh, stitches, sutras, right? Because uh, the uh, Sanskrit and Pali are Indo-European Indo languages. So there's a lot of uh, roots that are the same as the languages that many of us speak. So Vedana, the discourse on feeling tone from the Buddha. It's very short and sweet. At Savati, practitioners, feeling, this is a place, feeling born of eye contact is inconstant, inconstant, changeable, alterable. Feeling born of ear contact, eye contact, nose contact, tongue contact, right? So all these six sense gates, whatever feeling we feel, the Buddha says, it's inconstant, it's changing, it's alterable, it's not dependable. And he says, somebody who has a strong conviction that this is true is called a faith follower. And they've entered the uh, orderliness of rightness, meaning they got their head screwed on right. Even at the level of like, oh yeah, this makes sense. 
So it doesn't mean we have deep insight, but it just makes sense. Hopefully we're all here. You know what? Pleasantness isn't that constant. I mean, think about today. How many really unpleasant moments did you have today? Is it like that now? No, because they weren't constant. They lasted for a while, a moment of really unpleasant humiliation or a moment of stubbing your toe and throbbing in your toe or a moment of this kind of unpleasantness and that kind of unpleasantness. It was in constant. Same with the pleasure. So the Buddha says that even when you kind of order your life around this conviction, this so-called spiritual belief, this spiritual resolve, hey, Mark, feeling tone isn't that dependable. He, he, the Buddha says, you have a lot of momentum in your spiritual life. And the way they said it in the early Buddhist tradition is, before you die, you're going to have deep insight. You're on your way to deep insight, just having that conviction. And then he says that for those after pondering, have actual insight, <laughs> here it's translated, a modicum of discernment has accepted that these phenomena are this way, is called someone on the path, Dharma fo follower. No longer a run of the mill human being. And then one who knows and sees is called somebody with the first stage of awakening, right? So it's like that, it's just interesting that the Buddha often equates the awakening process with waking up around feeling tone and not being confused. That feeling tone is more substantial than it actually is. And just notice the next time you get a wave of pleasure, you go home, or I guess we're all home already, but you know, after the program in a little bit, you know, and you're with your honey or your four legged honey or whatever it is, you know, talking to your friend on the phone. And there's just a nice wave of so nice to be with this other being. Let's just say that that happens to you tonight. It'd be really nice just to be curious about how substantial, like this pleasure is real and it's insubstantial. Like really get that at the same time. Or you might notice like you've worked really hard to get a nice apartment or to decorate a room in your home or to make a nice cup of soup for yourself or whatever it might be. And to really meet the pleasure of it and to realize this will last for a while and then it will evaporate, it will fade away because I've had a lot of nice bowls of soup. Or, you know, as nice as my home, I feel pretty um, settled and appreciative of my home. I've lived here now almost 30 years. Uh, this is the old common ground meditation space. Actually, this room was our old Dharma hall. And when common ground moved out in 2009, uh, when and I, because we owned the building to begin with, we just stayed here. And, has made it now we have a very big living room. <laughs> but uh, now it feels really comfortable. But I, it's like I realized, because I've been practicing a long time, like the beauty or the comfort I feel, the appreciation I feel, I realize I can't grab it. I can't actually own it. I can't convert that momentary pleasantness that I experience quite often every day. There are many moments where I'm appreciating my home. It's not a rare occurrence. I appreciate it a lot. And I appreciate my cat. And I appreciate like I have good food in my refrigerator. But I, I notice I can't kind of own it or grab it and make it mine in a way that like makes me safe or gives me permanent satisfaction. And that's interesting. And that's what we want to get interested. That's part of our contemplation of pleasure is to see that. And this sutta that I just sort of reviewed for you, it's really the Buddha talking about that whole pathway. That's all we're doing basically is stabilizing our awareness, 
And one of the ways we stabilize our awareness is we do what the Buddha did when he remembered that settled experience he had when he was a little boy. And we take advantage, we get good at pay, paying attention to relatively stable pleasures like the pleasure of seclusion and calm and inner joy and inner ease and loving kindness because that really stabilizes the awareness. And then with this more stable, sensitive awareness, we watch all the uh, feeling tones come and go, whatever, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. And we observe the ephemeral, insubstantial nature of feeling tone. And that, surprisingly maybe, is what really supports the awakening process. So I wanna just cover a couple of the questions. I really appreciate people sending in these questions and feel free to do that uh, in the few weeks, I guess, that we have less left in this course. So this came uh, over a week ago from John and I'm gonna read both John and Dave um, had uh, interesting questions. Feeling tone, their associations and their disentangling. I wish I could translate Polly. Short of that, it seems translating the phrase feeling tone into language my body recognizes might be worthwhile. For me, feeling tones are sensitivities held in the torso that respond and continue in reaction to the six sense gates existing before emotions. The hook, stress, is the continue in reaction part. I become frightened by the prospect of their persistence. For example, if I don't squash them, distract myself, or in other ways run from feeling tone, it will grow and become so unbearable that it may be overwhelming. Doubt asks whether mindfulness, noticing, will be enough, as Analeo says, to nip it in the bud. Yeah, really great reflection. And uh, yeah, I think basically what you said sounds right to me, um, but not all feelings will be felt in the body. But feelings really is, as I mentioned, I think last way, last week, this bridge between the two. And uh, Dave's comment is somewhat similar. Um, he writes, for some time I felt, a, uh, I have a felt sense in the body after that second arrow has penetrated, right? So the mind has reacted to a feeling tone in a way that's made the body and mind tight, perhaps. The felt sense in the mind has been pretty much noticing the unsatisfactory nature as tightness or tingling in the shoulders, chest, back, thighs, around the temples and the arms. I need to read further the attachment and, refl and reflect on it. I need to read further the attachment and reflect on it. It seems that noticing the effects in the body is much easier than noticing the feeling tone in the mind. Yes, absolutely true. Or is the mental noting of the feeling tone of that second dart in the body what we are investigating as the mental feeling? Well, it's really, they're related. You know, that's the thing is the body often does reflect the mind as the mind often reflects the body. But in the case of being a human being, subtle is more significant than gross. And this is a little bit different than kind of in the West where materialism sort of reigns. And we tend to think of the mind being birthed by the material. You know, we have a mind because we have this gross physical body and the body has a brain. And because of the brain, we have a mind. But in practice and generally in Eastern systems of thought, it's really the material is a manifestation of the mind, much like in our dreams tonight, when you go to bed and you have a dream, you'll have a material existence in your dream, won't you? You'll be driving a car or you'll be eating food or doing whatever you're gonna do in your dream. It will feel like a material existence, but that material existence is arising out of the mind, correct? So why is this different? How are we so sure that this physical reality 
is causing the mind as opposed to the mind is responsible for this so-called physical reality. At least from this little sharing here, we should keep an open mind. We don't really know, do we? Because we know like when we dream at night, that seems when we're in the dream, seems like reality, physical reality. Let me just read a little bit before we break into groups. This is just a, a, a passage from Venerable Analio about this mind-body connection in response to the email that John and, and um, Dave wrote. Does this mean that the experience of feeling is entirely mental and bears no relationship to the body? This does not seem to be the case. In fact, common experience indicates that the actual experience of pleasant or painful feeling involves the body as well as the mind. Joy may manifest as the rising, uh, as the raising of hair or goose bumps, goose pimples, <laughs> just as displeasure may show its effect through the bodily tension and facial expressions. Again, obtaining or losing desirable objects can affect the heartbeat and blood circulation, or else intense feelings can cause faster breathing, etc. Now, isn't this true? Like, especially people we know. If you're around a good friend, someone you know quite well, and they're experiencing something really deeply unpleasant, you can read it in their body, even not being their body, but just observing their body. You can, because often the body is reflecting what's the unpleasantness of what's going on in the mind. And then a little later, <clears throat> this is the, I linked to this last week. Uh, in last week's email to this section from Venable Analia's book. Feelings can thus be seen as an intermediary between the body and the mind, having a conditioning effect in both directions. One aspect of this intermediary role is that whatever happens in the body is mentally felt through the medium of feelings, while the other aspect is that the effective tone of mental processes influences the body through the medium of feelings. And this is that great churning of our experience. We have a lot of feeling tone and we're learning like, as we say sometimes in activist work, especially around racism and some of these more sticky sexism, sticky areas where we really want to do some deep healing. You know, one of the, adages you hear activists say, can you stand the heat? Learning to stand the heat. And this really aligns with Dharma practice. You know, as we do our Dharma practice, really getting interested in feeling tone, we have to be willing to stand the heat or like it's intense to be interested in feeling tone. Mostly there's a moment of feeling tone and then immediately we're in our re reactivity about that particular feeling tone we're feeling. But just to stay in the alive dynamic of feeling this and then feeling that and then feeling the next moment, the pleasantness of it, the neutrality of it, the unpleasant of it, that's, that's a different way to be a human being. And it's a quite alive, rich way. But we have to sort of build our capacity to be aware of feeling tone. And that's really why we have this course. So please remember with these small groups and um, even if you're not gonna stay for whatever reason, just stay for a few more minutes if you would, uh, because you might find somebody in your home to have this conversation with. So create a real safe environment, introduce yourselves, have that sense. This is sacred space for 15, 20 minutes that we have together. And we're gonna give everybody, you know, two, three minutes just to talk and we really hold that space where we allow for pauses. We don't immediately go to the next person when the person who's speaking pauses. We give them a couple minutes because they may have more to say. And we don't try to like take care of them. We're just there listening in our body and aware of our body. That's a real generous way to listen to someone. And then each person gets their turn 
And then with whatever time is left, open conversation. That's the time you ask clarifying questions. You don't interrupt the person when they're talking that initial go round. And then of course we hold everything in confidence. We try to be aware of impact. So even though we wanna speak spontaneously about what we're learning in particular about pleasant experience, we just wanna be sensitive. So we're taking care of each person in our group, okay? Maybe I'll just make one announcement um, before I leave. I just was part of this uh, truth and justice vigil that uh, Stacy and I, O, two of our teachers held. Um, and they're gonna be doing that going forward on Tuesday evening, six to 7.30, I think. And just encouraging for the length of the trials of the officers who were responsible for the killing of George Floyd, just holding space for us in Minneapolis. It's especially relevant, but probably for all of us as, as a society, we do this work of unpacking racism. So feel free to join in for that. And there's a half day retreat this Saturday you can join in on uh, one to five in the afternoon. We always have a loving kindness practice every Friday, seven to 8.30, I'll be leading this one, but you can go any Friday, seven to 8.30 for that. And lots of other things. One last thing is on the 10th, Saturday the 10th, Shelly, Meski and I, three of our teachers, um, will be leading a workshop related to our course here. It's called Relating Wisely to the Sensual World. What do we do with our experience of sensuality? How to not be neurotically afraid of sense experience or neurotically attached. So join us for that Saturday. It will be a lot of small and large group discussions as well as some talks and meditations. And that's on the 10th. So thank you, Michelle, for dividing people into small groups and hope to see everybody next Monday. Take care.